So there is this thing called the criteria for causality, you know, in medical statistics. They did, they went through all that. They got every study that's ever been done on cholesterol and they plugged it in and they found regardless of anything else, whether they're insulin resistant or not, whether they have inflammation or not, whether they have damage to their arteries, hypertension, smoking, any of that stuff with regard to nothing else. If we just took a normal human and infuse them with cholesterol, they end up with atherosclerosis. You don't need inflammation. You don't need diabetes. You don't need insulin resistance you don't need anything else just cholesterol being elevated in your bloodstream by itself like just having too many of these you know lipoproteins floating around um, by itself caused atherosclerosis welcome to the how i healed it podcast here at how i healed it we get to hear stories from those who have healed their bodies from the unhealable through alternative methods and the experts who are passionate about whole body health and healing as I have been on my own healing journey, I have found that the number one thing that has kept me going is learning from others who have gone before me. I believe we can gain nuggets of wisdom from each healing story that we hear. Thanks in advance for subscribing to our podcast so we can continue to bring these amazing stories. I'm your host, Plantfully Megan. Let's dive in. Before we jump into this awesome episode with Dr. Muhammad Allo, MD, I want to touch on a few things. First, I want to say that I love how Dr. Allo is bridging the gap between allopathic skill and science-backed diet and lifestyle changes that we can all make as patients for best long-term health outcomes. In this podcast, we talk a lot about dietary and lifestyle changes, and we also talk about pharmaceuticals that he recommends to patients that he works with who do not choose to make those radical diet and lifestyle shifts. If you know me, you know I am always going to choose the radical and more natural options when possible, even if those are the harder options to, to choose. I believe when people have clear, actionable steps, they can make natural lifestyle and dietary changes that will better their health and their long-term health outcomes. I will also say thank goodness for pharmaceuticals in situations where they are needed and for when lifestyle and dietary changes cannot be made for whatever reason that is. They can be absolutely life-saving. Can't wait for you to hear this amazing talk with Dr. Muhammad Allah. Hey guys, it's Megan, and today I get the honor of chatting with Dr. Muhammad Allo, who is a board-certified cardiologist, certified personal trainer, and author of multiple books. He's an expert in heart health, and what I love about Dr. Allo is his science-backed, balanced view of a healthy diet. Today, we're going to cover topics such as, does dietary cholesterol impact our body in a negative way, and the genetic component of cholesterol. Also, how to live an optimal, healthy life. Dr. Alla, thanks so much for being on. I'm so excited to have you and would just love to hear your story and what got you as a cardiologist into really delving into the diet side of diet affects our heart health. No, well, thanks for having me. First of all, I'm super excited to uh, be here. Um, so yeah, so I'm a board certified cardiologist. I've been a cardiologist for a long time, obviously. Um, but what I did before cardiology, I think had more of an effect on my, you know, weight loss, my passion about nutrition, weight loss and all of that. Um, I've always been an athlete. I played football, you know, pretty much my entire life in high school, you know, in college, um, coached football. I currently still coach football. You know, I coach the fifth and sixth grade junior Cougars. I've coached flag football, tackle football, you know, almost every level. So I've trained a lot of athletes. And one of the things that I noticed, like, and I had a, I had a group of friends that would always come over and train with me. I have my own like home gym and we train in there and it's a lot of fun. I train myself. Obviously I train my kids when COVID hit, it was like, oh, wow, I'm glad we have this place because gyms were shut down for months on end. Um, so me and a group of friends at around that point in time, were like, Hey, let's just meet up every day. We can distance, we can wear masks, whatever. Um, so we would meet at my home gym, which is a huge gym. It's not like a little corner. It's like, uh, it's almost like 4,000 square feet. It's like this little pole barn that we have on our property. Um, we would meet there and work out. And I just wanted to make sure that I knew what I was doing when I trained other people. Cause I trained my athletes. I trained my kids. All of them are athletes. They all play multiple sports. I always tell people I have four kids in like 10 different sports. Um, so it's a lot, it's pretty hectic and you know, you, each kid has to train slightly differently. So for me, it was really important to get certified as a personal trainer. So I know what I'm talking about. Um, mainly so I know like this is the right way to train these kids and these kids and these kids, you know, are training for this sport and that sport. I wanted to make sure that 
they were training correctly for each sport to prevent injury, to get better at kicking or throwing or whatever their sport was. Um, so that was very important. Uh, me personally, I've always been super fascinated by nutrition, diet, and exercise. I'd say for ever since I was like 16, 17 years old, you know, everyone goes through high school, you get to college, you put on a few pounds, you try every diet in the world, you, the pounds come off, then they come back on again. Then, you know, it's like a yo-yo where you, and I tell this to my patients, you're going to be gaining and losing the same 20 pounds for the next 20 years if you don't do it right. right. Um, so doing it right is the trick. You know, how do we actually do it correctly in a way that's sustainable? And it's not always the same for everyone. There are lots of ways uh, to lose weight. I always tell people I'm diet agnostic. You can do uh, whatever diet you want, as long as it's not a malignant diet that's going to raise your cholesterol to astronomic levels. For the vast majority of people, if you do a diet and lose weight, your cholesterol numbers, your health markers, inflammatory markers, all will come down and all will improve. Um, so to me, that's very important. I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was talking about. Um, so it's been like a lifelong journey of studying and editing and researching. I've written multiple books on weight loss. Um, I even in, eventually wrote a heart healthy book. So it, it started out actually, you'll laugh at this. Um, it started act, actually as a suggestion from my patients. They're like, doc, can you just give us like a handout? You know, I know you always tell us to do this and that to lose weight. Can you just give us like a quick little handout? So I started out as a handout, you know, it'd be like a one page thing. Try to do this, try to do that. If you do all these things, you should generally lose weight because it's not that complicated. Usually sometimes people overcomplicate it. So it started out as a handout and they're like, well, what if I do this? Then what do I do? And then, you know, it became two pages, three pages, four pages. It got to be like really long. I'd start emailing them the, the PDF and then they're like, you know, this is too much. Can you just put it into a book? So finally I was like, all right, fine. I'll just make this into a book. But then I'm like a perfectionist. I'm not just going to give people a 20 page book. You know, I mean, you could summarize the vast majority it ended up being 168 pages, which is still not a lot, but you could summarize most of it probably in 15 to 30 pages. Um, but I wanted to dive deep into the research so people couldn't say, well, that's not true. Well, that's not true. Well, how can you say this? So I made sure that everything in there had the research studies, the links to the studies, you know, the summaries of the studies of why this works, how it works, why it's better for your heart, why it's not better for your heart. You know, what is the science behind actual weight loss? The book is actually called Actual Weight Loss. So how do you actually lose weight? So it's called Actual Weight Loss. I'm not here really to talk about the book, but generally that's how it started. And then later the patients, you know, they were getting my books and people online and, you know, you know, you get a lot of followers online. I don't know. It's in the millions now. Um, I think last calculated, it was 4.2 million views a month. <laughs> I had no idea this was going to happen. I thought I was just getting online to share cardiology information now I get over 4 million impressions or views or however you want to view it a month. Um, but a lot of people are like, well, why, why don't you just give us some couple of recipes? Like how would you eat with lean protein and make it healthy for your heart? Um, so that's super unique. So I ended up coming up with a heart healthy cookbook and it's divided up by calories because the, the way you're going to lose weight is you need to eat a certain number of calories. So if you're supposed to eat 1800 calories to lose weight, you flip to that chapter, you make breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you're guaranteed to lose weight if you're eating 1800 calories and all the recipes are like super flavorful, super nutritious, very heart healthy, no salt, no saturated fat. Um, but the key is there's enough protein that you don't lose muscle because if you're in a calorie deficit and you're trying to lose weight, the biggest problem is a lot of people will lose lean body mass. It's not just muscle, but lean body mass or fat, fat free mass. You don't want to lose fat free mass or lean body mass. So getting enough protein in each you know, for each person, depending on their body weight and how many calories they need to eat is essential to preventing muscle loss and or, you know, even gaining some muscle. Because if you do start lifting heavy weights while in a calorie deficit, you could theoretically gain muscle. It just kind of depends on how trained you are, how much exercise you're used to doing, whether you lifted weights or not previously. A lot of those things matter. But for an average person, even if you don't exercise and you eat 1800 calories, you'll probably lose some muscle. If you get enough protein that mitigates that, you know, as much as possible. So that's why I designed that book. And it, it's fascinating. It's super unique. You literally figure out how many calories you need to, to eat in the first chapter. You eat, you flip to that chapter, make those foods and you will lose weight and it's heart healthy and it's, you know, salt free, saturated, fat free, et cetera. And there's enough muscle that you don't lose protein. So it's a very, very, very unique book. My, the dean of my school of medicine, Dr. Karen Nichols, she bought the book. I had no idea. And she, she texts me one day on LinkedIn and she says, Hey, 
your book is incredibly unique. She's like, I'm a cookbook snob. I'm a cookbook connoisseur. That's what she said. I'm a cookbook connoisseur. I have so many cookbooks. She's like, I've never seen anything like this. She, she was super impressed. I was like, oh, well, good. I mean, if you're a cookbook snob and you like it, I must be doing something right. But no, that's kind of how I got into it. A lot of it was patience. My patients were super fascinated by it. And the problem is you go to a doctor and they don't get a lot of nutritional teaching. I'm sure you've noticed. You go to see your doctor and they're just like, they repeat stuff they hear online. Oh, don't eat after 7 p.m. or avoid carbs or never eat pizza again or, you know, just random stuff. It, it could theoretically work. I mean, it, it may work, but it's not a lot, you know, a full blown plan that we know is going to work. It's like, okay, maybe avoid juice, you know, <laughs> like they'll tell you something like that. or eat more fruits and vegetables. Sure. That could work. But if you eat back calories from other things, probably not going to work. Um, so it was a lot of that part of it. And I, and the biggest thing is I've been teaching at medical conferences, you know, proper weight loss. And I have like three hour lectures that I give at medical conferences. I remember one time, I think it was Indiana, someplace in Indiana, Indianapolis, they called me and they said, Hey, could you give us your weight loss lecture? I said, sure. Do you guys have a three hour time slot? <laughs> they're like, what? They're like, we have, they're like, we have 45 minutes. I said, I can, you know, I can shrink it down, but trust me, just give me three hours. Uh, it'll work really, really well. Uh, so they did. They actually gave me a three hour time slot, two hours and 45 minutes. And I talked for two hours and 45 minutes straight. That whole thing is on YouTube. I put all my lectures on YouTube. Um, so the, the people sat, no one looked at their phones. No one played on their phones. No one left literally for like three hours. And I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate and I try to be funny. So it's not like just a boring lecture. I try to make it almost like a workshop. I ask them questions. We laugh. I tell jokes, you know, it's kind of funny. So it's not like I'm just sitting there reading words off a slide to you for three hours straight. Um, but it's, it's fun. Yeah. One thing I think, um, I would love to dive into is dietary cholesterol. I think there's a lot of, I don't want to say controversy, but I guess that is the word controversy around does dietary cholesterol negatively or positively impact your health? And what does that look like in a, in a healthy diet? How does that affect you? What does a healthy diet look like in that regard? So that's a really good question. So the the problem is most people either have a yes or no answer for you. You ask somebody, and if they don't really know what they're talking about, like you, you'll notice in your field, when somebody just spits out an answer that's either black or white, or there's no in between, and it's just like a yes or a no, they don't know the nuance. They just give you an answer. They're just like, uh, dietary cholesterol is fine, or it's not fine, or whatever. There's no nuance in it. So I think if we back up a little. Uh, on the question, it would be kind of kind of better. So this is a um, lipoprotein, right? The job of these things is to traffic cholesterol, energy, fatty acids. Food that you consume ends up being trafficked. Um, on the inside of it, you have triglycerides, which are turquoise colored, and yellow is the cholesterol. Um, cholesterol that ends up in your intestines eventually ends up in your bloodstream with these. Now the question is, how does that happen? So there's three general ways if we start with the intestines, because that's easier, there's three ways that cholesterol ends up in your intestines. Number one is dietary cholesterol. It's not a huge amount, but anywhere from 10 to 15% of the cholesterol that ends up in your intestines started out from food that you ate. Things that are higher in cholesterol would be like shrimp and maybe the yolk of eggs, uh, not the egg whites, but the yolk. Those have probably, in, in the American standard American diet, those are probably the foods that have the most cholesterol. So it's about 10, 15% of the cholesterol in your intestines does come from food. Um, the next amount is from your liver. And your liver delivers cholesterol to your intestines in two ways. Well, it, it gets there all in one way. It gets there through your bile duct. Um, your, your liver does it in two ways. Number one, it collects all the cholesterol from the rest of your body. The rest of your cells that make cholesterol send it back to your liver in lipoproteins. Your liver has a receptor. It grabs these out of circulation, pulls them in, takes them apart, degrades them. And then that extra cholesterol gets packaged up into these things called micelles. And they get excreted through the bile duct into your uh, intestines. That's the main way that cholesterol gets into your uh, intestines. And then another way is your liver's own cholesterol in synthesis. Your liver makes its own cholesterol too, just like any organ, every cell in your body makes its own cholesterol, but your liver makes its own cholesterol too. 
It also sends that through the bile, you know, through the micelles down into your intestines. So now what happens to cholesterol in your intestines? That's the major question. So all of that, mo not all of it, but uh, most of it gets reabsorbed back into your body. Um, there's these things called chylomicrons, which are just like these, but a lot bigger. Um, these are about 20 nanometers in size. Chylomicrons can be over 70, um, but they're, they're larger lipoproteins. Essentially, they package up the cholesterol and they leave your intestine through the lymphatic system. They go all the way up into your thoracic duct. They get absorbed into your circulatory system there. They do two things when they get there. They go to uh, muscles and deliver energy to muscles. So your muscles need energy. They need you know to function. They deliver energy. And the energy is free fatty acids or fatty acids, um, triglycerols or triglycerides or cholesterol. They first deliver it to muscles. If the muscles don't need any more, um, which happens quite a bit because they can also make their own. But if they don't need any more energy, they don't need calories or whatever, then they go to adipose tissue, which is fat cells, and they store the extra in your fat cells. That's how you gain weight. Um, so that's what chylomicrons do. Then they eventually go back to your liver and they're degraded. Your liver also makes LDL particles um, that also like go around and collect cholesterol from other areas. There's also these other ones called, um, let's see, these ones, there's two kinds. There's ones that have an ApoA1 on it, and then there's an ApoB on it. The ApoBs are the LDLs. The ApoA1s are the HDLs. The HDLs job, and these are what people usually call good and bad. The reason we don't like to call it good and bad is because in part of their life, LDLs that are technically bad are doing a lot of good, and HDL is doing mostly good, but not always, You know, depending on what part of its lifespan it's in. So there's, it doesn't make a lot of sense to call them good or bad, but it's simple for patients. Like if you tell a patient, hey, your bad cholesterol is bad or high, you know, that's not good. Um, but generally speaking, those LDLs go back into circulation. HDLs generally take uh, cholesterol out of your arteries. They do return it back to the liver or they transfer it to an LDL, which then returns it back to your liver. So they do play a good role. Uh, as well, that's called indirect reverse cholesterol transport. Um, the biggest question people ask is, well, don't we need cholesterol? <laughs> yes, you absolutely need cholesterol. You'll die without it. Every single cell in your body, if you look at these cells, the cell membrane here has free cholesterol in it. It's different than the cholesterol ester that's inside. This is a free cholesterol molecule. But without cholesterol in your cell membranes, your cells would not be fluid and you would be dead. So you absolutely need cholesterol. That's not the question. The question is, what if you have too much? Because too much of a good thing is always bad. Um, like, like you need water to live, but too much water too quickly also kills you, right? But you get what I'm saying? A small amount of something may not be harmful, but the dose, when it gets high enough or consumed too quickly at high doses can be a problem. Like water is the prime example, salt, you know, there's all kinds of things. You do need salt for life, but if you drink too much, you know, salt, salt water, seawater too quickly, you're not going to do very well. Um, so there's all kinds of examples of that in nature. So yeah, you absolutely do need cholesterol without question, but every cell in your body can make it without you eating more cholesterol. I'm getting to the dietary part. Um, so your people say, well, don't you need cholesterol for hormones? You know, your testicles need to make testosterone, your ovaries need to make estrogen, progesterone, your adrenals need to make cortisol, you know, stress hormones, whatever. Um, all of those cells in your body can make their own cholesterol. They do not need help. They can make it from a citrate and an acetate molecule. That's the building blocks of cholesterol. And, and then cholesterol eventually can be um, changed or like, you know, transformed into testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, whatever, cortisol. It can be, it's like a building block for those hormones. Um, in and of itself is a hormone. So you, but you, you can make it all from acetate and citrate which is in every cell anyways. That's, you know, you're, even if you consume zero cholesterol, consume zero saturated fat, consume no amount of cholesterol whatsoever, you will still have tons of it. And some people, depending on their genetic, will have more. Some people will have less. That, that part is definitely uh, hugely genetically uh, determined, but you can improve it. Um, dietary cholesterol, like I said, is makes up about 10 to 15% of the cholesterol that ends up in your intestines that ultimately does get reabsorbed. They have found in studies that it, at a normal intake of cholesterol, which for most Americans is under 300 milligrams a day, 
under 300 milligrams a day, cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality are not going to go up significantly. But if you start getting over 400, that's when it becomes an issue. If you're getting 400 to 1,000 milligrams a day of dietary cholesterol, it's a straight line up for all-cause mortality, which means dying of any cause, and and then also cardiovascular mortality, which is obviously something we care a lot about. We care about both, obviously, but that one definitely goes up as well at, at intakes over 400. So it you'd have to be at extremes of intake. It's very hard to do that, but there are some people now following these diets that are like, I eat six eggs a day and a bunch of steak and all this. I mean, <laughs> it will raise your cholesterol and, you know, the the more you consume, the worse uh, you'll be. I'm, and, you know, I don't know why this diet became so popular. Now, there is a caveat to that, like the Atkins style diets, you know, in the 80s and 90s. If you do eat in a calorie deficit, but you're eating mostly meat and you're losing weight, your cholesterol numbers could actually improve. And that's been proven, you know, over the years, ever since we had the Atkins style diet, South Beach diet, the low carb, you know, higher protein diets, that has been proven that you could technically eat mainly just protein and your numbers won't go up. However, the problem with these newer diets like keto, for example, it's not like you're eating lean protein. It's actually like more fat, like 70% of your calories need to come from fat and healthy fats like, you know, olive oil, avocados, you know, things like that can only make up so much of your diet. A lot of it ends up being butter and full fat, you know, yogurts and stuff like that. It becomes very difficult to eat, you know, cleaner fats or not saturated, unsaturated fats. If you, you want to eat more poly and mono unsaturated fats to, you know, keep your uh, cholesterol down. The, the reason saturated fat is a problem is because it, it increases cholesterol synthesis. Your liver starts to make more cholesterol and reduces the number of LDL receptors. That's these guys. This comes floating by and it grabs it and takes it out of circulation. You reduce these guys, the receptors. So more cholesterol will be in circulation and there's not that many places it can go one of the places that it goes is inside of your arteries. It starts depositing in your arteries and you end up with um, plugged up arteries. And that's kind of the problem with saturated fat is it definitely does that. Now there's other problems with saturated fat. You know, it increases inflammation. It, it has been linked to and or causes diabetes, you know, various mechanisms for that. Um, I'm not telling people you can't ever eat red meat or saturated fat. You know, that's really hard ask. You know, people say, well, why don't you just recommend a plant plant-based diet? We can, but like how many people are, are actually going to do that? It's much easier to tell people eat leaner cuts of meat, whether they're red or poultry or fish or salmon, rather than telling people just avoid meat altogether. You know, I mean, it's Right, because not, it's more sustainable over a long period of time for more people. Yeah, it is. It is more sustainable. The less restrictive your diet, the easier it is to stick to, right? right. I mean, mm -hmm. studies have shown that long term. That's why some of these, like the keto diets and- low carb diets in a, in a lot of studies showed that people ended up with more eating disorders and couldn't maintain the diet long enough because they dropped out of the studies because they just mentally just couldn't do it. Right. And of course there's studies that show other diets are not sustainable, like eating all meat, mm -hmm. you know, who could do that or eating yeah. all plants. Mm -hmm. um, that recent twin study that they did where they put half of yeah. the twins on an all plant-based diet and half of them on a more omnivorous diet then both of them were supposed to be a healthy version. Like it was a healthy omnivore, healthy plant. It wasn't like they were eating Pop-Tarts because yeah. they're plant-based, right? <laughs> Which technically you could. Um, but they had a healthy plant diet versus healthy omnivore diet. The group on a lot more people in the, in the plant diet said, I don't think I can maintain this long term. You know, it's cool. We're doing the study for eight weeks, but I'm probably not going to be able to do this for the rest of my life. So the, the harder the diet is and the more restrictive it is, and it doesn't cooperate with your preferences or eating style, um, the, the harder it is going to be to maintain. The, the biggest thing that we found scientifically with the studies on long-term weight maintenance or weight loss, if you're trying to lose, is how, how long you can adhere to the diet you've selected. If you like eating meat, then you probably will be able to stick to something like that. As long as weight is coming off, most people's cholesterol numbers and health markers inflammation will improve because the number one driver of inflammation is obesity. If you have um, more adipose tissue, which is fat fat tissue, 
you will have more inflammation without question. If we lose weight, regardless of how you use it, all your inflammatory markers will go down. So that's a huge factor too, that if you pick a diet that generally is not that good for you, but you lose a bunch of weight, it may actually turn out right. fine. The percentage of people that we see whose cholesterol sky, go sky high with these keto style diets is somewhere around 30 to maybe 40, 45%. Those people, what, so what I tell people is like, look, pick the diet you want to do. If your cholesterol skyrockets, then obviously we can cut it or, you know, change it around or tweak it. But, you know, decide if this is really something you want to do. Some people say, no, I'm just going to do this for three months. Well, I mean, that's like a quick fix. It's a short-term solution. It's not really going to work, uh, but some people just want to do it. So, and they just want the weight off. Nowadays, because I'm also an obesity medicine physician, I do a lot of weight loss. Now with the newer medications that we have, these GLP-1 receptor agonists and some of the older medications like fentramine and diethylpropion, now that we can combine some of these meds together, we're almost like causing people to lose weight without any effort. I mean, I've had a guy, the, the craziest uh, one I've had so far is I've had a patient who lost, well, ha I've had two. One patient lost 176 pounds. He was supposed to go for gastric bypass. They sent him to me to clear him for gastric bypass. I'm a cardiologist. They sent him to me like to clear him for surgery. But I asked him, I said, so when, are the, when is the surgery? He said, it's not going to be for a few years. I said, what do you mean? You know, they usually send you, send you to me to clear you, it's, you know, you already have a date scheduled. He's like, no, 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 it's going to be a few years. I said, why? He said, well, I have to be under 400 pounds first. So it's like, oh, don't worry about it. I got you. So I put him on some meds and he ended up 326. I think he was 476. He ended up 326, you know, 150 pounds in a matter of maybe four or five months. Another patient lost 80 pounds in two months. So these medications are very life-changing. Um, we are now able to almost force people into weight loss before, no matter what we tried, it was really hard. Some of the older medications that we used to use, they were pills and we, we tried them. Some people would lose weight. Some people wouldn't. And then it's a matter of like, oh, you know, we only lost three pounds in three months. Well, you know, might as well just stop the medicine. It's not really doing anything for you. So I think we have way more tools now uh, to be able to help people with their weight loss goals. And what happens is when they're on these medications, a lot of patients will say, Oh my God, I didn't realize how much I was eating. You know, like I, I, I would just eat at night because my family got together and I was bored and I would just start putting like Reese's pieces and nuts and, you know, whatever, you know, in my mouth, I had no idea why I was doing it. Now I know like it turns off that food noise. They call it food noise. Um, eating out of boredom, eating for no reason, eating just because the food's sitting there in front of you. Like you, it shuts off those weird cravings. They've also found that it shuts off a lot of other weird cravings like shopping, biting your nails, you know, compulsive, this or that thing, you know, whatever it might be. So I don't know. They, these drugs seem to have some pretty uh, magical um, effects in some people. Circling back to the Adkins thing that you had mentioned, it sounds like the weight loss aspect is a huge part of it. So if someone like me who's naturally thin just switched to eating all meat, you know, in, which would be more Adkin style, probably wouldn't see the benefits that somebody who's overweight who begins eating Adkins in a calorie deficit and begins to lose weight because then their markers are all coming down. So almost what I hear you saying is there is a huge importance around weight loss when it comes to taking care of your heart health and making sure that your markers are your inflammatory markers and everything are coming down. Weight loss is a huge part of that. Regardless of how that is accomplished, you're going to see a benefit in health, which is one of the reasons why you're so passionate about exercise and um, weight loss and all that kind of stuff. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Somebody who's already thin that does not need to lose weight probably shouldn't adopt a diet like that. You probably don't want to do one of these keto, carnivore, Atkins style, high protein, high fat diets. You want to eat a more balanced diet. We always recommend a Mediterranean style diet because it has the most research. It reduces like 13 different kinds of cancer in addition to heart disease, obviously. it's You can adopt it to what you like. There's no actual this is an exact Mediterranean diet. It's like, you know, eat more fruits, vegetables, nuts, fiber, fish, you know, uh, olive oil versus, you know, butter. 
Um, you know, it's, it's more of a guideline than an actual diet. So it's not like you can go buy a book called Mediterranean diet. Well, I'm sure you could, yeah. but it's not like, <laughs> it's not like this is actually what is a Mediterranean diet, right? It's just like a guideline guiding principles of what people in a Mediterranean region would eat or like in Okinawa, right. Japan, you know, those kind of types just of generally 90% plant-based generally speaking with right. the fish and some eggs and milk and different things in the 10% category. With someone who has a genetically high, I have a family member who has genetically high cholesterol. What do you recommend to patients like that who come in where maybe they're eating a relatively healthy diet, like a Mediterranean diet? They're wanting to make more dietary changes just to support their heart health moving forward, but they are pervasively high cholesterol. What would you recommend to someone in that scenario? So and it depends on how high their cholesterol is. If their LDL cholesterol is above 190 and they have something called familial hypercholesterolemia, you can definitely diet and all that, like a Mediterranean style diet, like we talked about, cut saturated fat. The biggest thing is going to be cutting saturated fat. But in those cases, it's malpractice not to put them on medications because you are shortening their lifespan by decades, yeah. depending on which genetics they have. If it's heterozygous versus homozygous, if it's monogenic versus polygenic, if it's compound familial hypercholesterolemia, it really depends on a lot of issues. But not putting someone like that on medications is definitely malpractice. Right. That um, makes so sense. with that said- statins can be very helpful to lower cholesterol. Oh, absolutely. We usually start with a statin because they're, they've are they been around the longest. They have the most studies, the most research, the most data. They're super cheap. They're almost all generic. Um, seven of them. There's only one that isn't generic. Basically, there's six or seven different options. And we usually start there. They're very well tolerated. Some people do get some side effects, obviously, like with anything. Um, and if they get side effects, we can pick a different medication, switch them first. Usually, we'll switch them to a different statin first to see how they do. Because most insurances, it comes down to your, your insurance. Your health insurance is not going to allow us to put you on a more expensive medication if a cheaper one exists that still works. So they'll usually have you try two or three, maybe all the statins first, and then they'll approve one of the injectables like Rapatha or Bempidoic Acid, which is another pill actually. Um, Zetia is generic. So what I usually do for these people is I'll put them on a combination of Crestor and Zetia and see where their numbers land. If they land somewhere under 100 in the like 70 range, you know, depending on how long they've been so high, I'll probably leave them alone. Um, if they end up at 110, 105, they're still not below where we need them to be, then we could add on one of the injections. Uh, but it really depends on the person where they're starting at, you know, how high their numbers were, all that. They should obviously also eat healthy, you know. It makes no sense to eat cheeseburgers and Lipitor at the same time. Right. <laughs> yeah. So lowering egg intake, like you said, because you said, I think you said 400, around 400 milligrams. Yeah. So the, the eggs are not as, they don't matter as much as saturated fat. Saturated fat would be the, the bigger problem. And that's usually things like butter, bacon, cheese, lard, any fat that's solid at room temperature is saturated. So chicken skin, fat on steak. Those are going to be the biggest. In the U.S. diet, the biggest contributors to saturated fat intake would be cheese, you know, like pizza even, um, steak fat, stuff like that, butter. Those would be the biggest ones. Bacon. Where do you think people are getting this idea that I'm hearing quite a bit that uh, cholesterol isn't bad and modern medicine is just completely wrong about that? Yeah, I have no idea. So I think a lot of I think a lot of it started with so I think a lot of it is just bad data, old information. Like you have this guy called Malcolm Kendrick, who's not a cardiologist. He's like a general practitioner in England who's publishing books called The Cholesterol Con or The Cholesterol Myth or right. The Clot Thickens and like all these crazy books relying on data from the nineteen seventies when we didn't know as much as we know now. If you look at all the modern data and all the studies, actually there there was an article recently published that looked at every single study that's ever been done on cholesterol for like the last 100 years. They had 20 million data points. And their ultimate conclusion was that LDL cholesterol or ApoB 
causes atherosclerosis. Like without question, they, they did a study where they said what criteria needs to be met for us to be able to say that LDL causes atherosclerosis, not just correlates. Like forget, we don't want to prove correlation because everybody says, oh yeah, it just correlates. It's just associated. It's not a cause. You don't know the real cause. The real cause is insulin. The real cause is inflammation. The real cause is X, Y, Z. So these guys said, well, look, what is it going to take to prove actual causality what criteria needs to be met. So there is this thing called the criteria for causality, you know, in medical statistics. They did, they went through all that. They got every study that's ever been done on cholesterol and they plugged it in and they found regardless of anything else, whether they're insulin resistant or not, whether they have inflammation or not, whether they have damage to their arteries, hypertension, smoking, any of that stuff with regard to nothing else. If we just took a normal human and infused them with cholesterol, they end up with atherosclerosis. You don't need inflammation. You don't need diabetes. You don't need insulin resistance. You don't need anything else. Just cholesterol being elevated in your bloodstream by itself, like just having too many of these, you know, lipoproteins floating around um, by itself caused atherosclerosis. And they were able to demonstrate this actually in 1914, believe it or not. There's this guy, I think his name was Anthrowich or something like that. He took rabbits and he just infused them with high cholesterol levels, like into their bloodstream. You can't do this with humans, obviously. It'd be unethical. But they did it to rabbits. And the rabbit arterial models have proven to be very similar to humans. Um, not, and, and and they have done it, you know, on in humans. They, they looked at mothers. Um, so anyways, first the rabbits. They infused this into the rabbits. They all got atherosclerosis within weeks. Then they also looked at mothers whose cholesterols were elevated and ended up with a miscarriage. They looked at the fetuses. They all found fatty streaks in their aortas and fetuses of moms who had. So a fetus doesn't have inflammation, doesn't have arterial damage, doesn't have diabetes, generally speaking, doesn't have any of these things. But all they have is that they're getting their mom's lipoproteins. They're getting these crossing over into their circulation. They all had fatty streaks. Now, a lot of times when they, if they, the kids sometimes were, were born, um, and their their own LDL is not high, those things would go away. Um, they also look at autopsies of sh uh, soldiers that came back from the Vietnam War and World War II. If their cholesterols were high and they did autopsies on these 20-year-olds, uh, they found that they also had atherosclerosis. So there's, a, there's mountains and mountains of evidence. I'm not sure. Some of it is these people are just trying to sell you supplements like buy my supplement. Don't listen to the medical community because we're lying to you. We want to keep you sick. I have no idea why. We want to keep you sick forever so you could be our customers, which is absolutely blatantly false. Um, but generally, that's kind of like they, they, they say this and people buy into it. I don't know why they buy into it, but for some reason, people don't want to believe uh, medicine or doctors that, you know, recently, maybe it's been like that, but they just want to buy into some dream. They want to buy into some hocus pocus dream, you know, that they're going to be fine, even though they, their cholesterol is high, or they just want to eat the way they want to eat. So I usually tell people, look, if you're going to, if you just want to eat that way, no big deal. Just let us treat your cholesterol. Like if you're like, I'm eating this diet. I love it. I feel great. I've lost weight. I've lost 80 pounds. I feel amazing. My acne cleared up, whatever. Cause it is an elimination diet. Usually my psoriasis got better. My knee joints don't hurt. You know, they lost 80 pounds. So of course not. And they're like, I just want to stick with this. But my cholesterol right. is like 200, 220, right. whatever. Then so, we'll just put them on a medicine. When, when you're looking at the totality of all the evidence, it tends to lend towards Mediterranean rather than something like carnivore where you hear, I mean, I hear these doctors and they make really extreme statements, you know, saying you can eat all butter, all meat and barely any plant foods and that's the best way. And then they'll cite a study. And I think it can be really convincing for people who are listening. That's just your average lay person listening to a doctor because doctors carry uh, air of authority. And whenever you hear doctors say, state a, cite a study, but I think a lot of people don't realize that there are different types of studies. There's case studies, there's meta-analysis, there's different, there's a hierarchy when it comes to studies. What would be the best way for our listeners who want to feel equipped, they want to feel educated and whenever you go out there and maybe even, I mean, I have, I've gone to two, many different doctors who have given me different dietary advice from keto to plant-based um, to just eat more pizza because you need to gain weight. So what, how do, how could we as just patients arm ourselves and feel strong in that we've maybe looked at the evidence or feel strong 
um, in our own research of how we want to feed ourselves and take care of our bodies. So I think the most important thing is looking at financial incentives. A lot of these people claim they don't have financial incentives. They'll say, oh, I have nothing to gain or lose. But then they're like selling a book telling you that cholesterol is a myth or a con or some keto diet thing or carnivore diet thing. Like the, the main carnivore MD, Dr. Paul Saladino, which I interviewed or he interviewed me about this topic, he sells supplements that are organ meats, red meat, you know, supplements, liver supplements, whatever. Um, so I think a lot of it, you have to look at the financial incentives um, to see where they're coming from. Second of all, you can absolutely design a study to show almost anything you want. Like I can design a study that shows that eating fingernails is good, good for yeah. you or, you know, <laughs> reducing saturated fat doesn't make any, many, any difference. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to do that. And like you said, there's different types of studies. There's like case reports, which is like, you know, helps us generate a hypothesis. There's Petri dish studies, there's test tube studies, rat studies, animal models, which are good at hypothesis generation, but they're not higher levels of evidence. Then you have like randomized controlled studies, cohort studies, you've got epidemiological studies, then you've got a meta meta analysis, which is a study of studies. They pull in all the data and all the participants in one study, in like multiple studies, and put it all into one. And now you have like 20 million data points instead of just a thousand or two thousand or twenty thousand. So you have to look at that. And then at the ultimate highest level, I think it would be guidelines uh, and consensus statements. Like when the committee, you know, when you get a, a, a committee of 400 cardiologists from all over the world in the, you know, European Atherosclerotic Society, and they evaluate all the data and they say, here's how you should treat atrial fibrillation, or here's the best approach, approach to blood pressure or cholesterol, whatever it is. And they print out this like 180 page document going over all the evidence of this is why we think this is the best way to approach this. That should carry more weight than an orthopedic surgeon on YouTube telling you to eat steak. <laughs> like, you know, because that's literally what it is. Like none of these carnivore doctors are actually cardiologists. You know, one of them is a non-practicing psychiatrist. One of them is a orthopedic surgeon that is not a cardiologist, obviously at all. One of them is a family doctor that lost his credibility and medical license. I mean, a lot of these people have lots of legal baggage and, you know, stuff going on that they just need to sell something to stay alive or stay afloat. Or, I mean, I'm sure they have good intentions. I don't know. I can't judge people's intentions, but the, the information they're putting out is just false. Um, when when the entire world of cardiology is telling you that X is the correct answer and maybe we're looking at Y and you're like, no, no, no it's A. <laughs> like you're, you're on the opposite end of the spectrum. I agree with you that there is a lot of, and I've had my own, um, I guess you go down that path of conspiracy theory where it's just kind of, I think a lot, even in the past five years, we've seen that increase quite a bit. And I think science has taken a hit because of all of the spiraling that has gone down over the last few years. What would you say to those who are listening that are kind of like, oh, I think that all of the government entities, when it comes to food recommendations, as we've seen the food pyramid change you know, within our lifetime multiple times, what would you say to those people for things like the American Heart Association stuff that what they're recommending? Um, what would you how would you speak to that? So the I, I agree that the medical community needs to earn back the trust of the public. Absolutely. A lot has gone on in the last few years where people are just like, you know, first you told us this. Now you're telling us that I get all that. Um, one thing I will say, though, is that science changes, you know. What we thought 20 years ago was good to eat is not what we're going to think 20 years later, not even 20 minutes later. I mean, the food pyramid absolutely should change. It should change a lot, not just every six, seven, eight years or whatever, um, because we know more. The science advances. We have more data. We realize that maybe this thing wasn't as good as we thought it was, you know, like fish oil. We used to recommend it. We even used to prescribe it. We really don't anymore. It's not really even high up on the guidelines anymore. You know, there's all kinds of things that advance. And I think part of the bit, you're right. The public just is like, can you guys please make up your minds? Like they do this with eggs all the time. They're like, well, 20 years ago, you guys used to tell us that eggs are bad for you. So you guys don't know what you're talking about. And now you're telling me it's good. And then a year later, it's bad again. And like, I don't think it's like the, the eggs. That's the problem. No one is saying that you can't eat an egg. You know, you want to eat an egg here and there. No big deal. You just can't eat 30 of them in one day. 
right? I mean, it's like that same thing like with salmon. Salmon is good for you. So is olive oil. But if you drink a gallon of olive oil a day, you're going to gain weight. That's a lot of calories. It's the most nutrient or calorie dense thing is fat. So if you drink a gallon of olive oil a day, you're going to weigh 800 pounds at some point. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I, I think part of it is there's a lack of nuance when they hear the medical community say things like, we'll tell them, oh yeah, just, just avoid eggs. Like, wait, what? <laughs> like, you can't just say avoid eggs. Like there, there's a lot more to it. Or like, you can't just tell people never eat watermelon. I don't know. I'm just making something up. Like, wait, why? Like, what's the big deal? You know, like you have to have some nuance to it, but there's always going to be some people, regardless of how you present the facts and how you present the evidence, they're just too conspiratorial. They're always going to think that you were hiding something and we're just trying to trick them and we're out to get them because we make money off of them. I don't know why people think this. Look, even if I don't have a single cardiology patient left in the world, I will find something else to do. It's really not a big deal. Like there's plenty of stuff that I'd rather do. I coach football. I would love to be able to just coach football all day, all night. Um, but I mean, I think that part of it is, lack of trust. Some people are just naturally more conspiratorial, I think. Um, but also I think part of us is getting better messaging or better educating out there. Um, that's why I got on social media. A friend of mine, we were at a pool party in the summer. She said to me, she's like, listen, you need to get on TikTok. I said, what? She's like, yeah. She's like, you need to get on TikTok and start saying things. So that I, previously I only had Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, some of the more mature platforms that have aged up and it's like an older audience. They're like, no, no, no get on TikTok. That's where all the young people are. They need to hear what you're saying. So I did. And then like everything just exploded after that. Um, I ended up with way too many followers way too quickly, but mainly I was just giving boring medical advice. None of it is controversial. Sure. I try to keep it entertaining because I'm, I'm not a boring person. I would hate for somebody to just be like, hi, my name is Dr. Allo. Please do not do this. Like you got to make it funny, you know, catchy, whatever. Um, so I try to do that, but I think part of it also is um, reaching a wider audience that needs to hear certain messages in a certain way. And doctors, like, I'll be honest, doctors are not good communicators. I mean, when's the last time you went to a medical lecture and you're like, wow, what a great speaker this one is. They're just literally standing there reading the slides to you. And it's like the boringest thing on earth. Yeah. A lot of these uh, doctors who have gotten famous are really good communicators. And that's a, I mean, that is, it's a good thing if it's wielded with a good, you know, a good weapon behind it. But when it is uh, maybe not for the benefit of those who are listening, um, because it's, I, I do think it's very clear that a carnivore diet can be really harmful for an individual. And it, seems irresponsible to recommend something that can increase somebody's cholesterol so drastically in such a short period of time. Um, and so, but whenever you're really charming and a really good communicator that can come across and, you know, these people like Paul Saladino, who has 2 million followers, a lot of people are taking his advice and running with it, um, which is really crazy. And the funny thing is at the end of the interview that I did with him, he said, look, he's like, I get it. I know LDL cholesterol is heavily involved in atherosclerosis, but he didn't agree that it was the only thing needed. He thought that you need insulin resistance and other things or inflammation, whatever it was, I forget, to also cause atherosclerosis when I you know, showed him what I thought was overwhelming and convincing evidence of young people with atherosclerosis that don't have any of those other things. They don't have inflammation. They don't have insulin resistance. They're don't, they're not obese. They're super lean. I presented multiple studies and cohorts of people with the exact thing he was asking. And I showed him that it's not true. He said, well, maybe, okay, maybe, but maybe the, it's, it's not the spark. It's the fire or the wood or something. I don't know what he used an analogy. I don't remember it, but obviously I think he, he's, he's smart enough to know that it is involved heavily. He said it's heavily involved. He came to that conclusion. He just wasn't, buying that it was only that, which we know now, you know, based on the mountains of evidence that that's all you need. If your LDL cholesterol is high, you don't need anything else. We've demonstrated this in children that have nothing. I mean, a five-year-old who is lean and an athlete has nothing else. Like, you know, you infuse them with cholesterol, you get atherosclerosis. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science. So what is the 
the general healthy diet that you recommend, it's a med- is it a Mediterranean diet? Is that what you recommend when you're working with your patients? So if you, if you want the most optimal diet, you probably should be eating more of a plant-based diet, right? I mean, if you want the actual, what the data and the evidence shows, if it's the closer it is to a whole food plant-based, we're not talking like Pop-Tarts and Doritos, even though mm-hmm. technically those are not animal products. Yeah, that's vegan. Whole food plant based is whole food. More whole food. <laughs> the more whole food plant based it is, the better. Now, it's not that easy to stick to, obviously. So if you if you, and and also if you want to get enough protein to like build muscle and all that, you can get it from plants. It's just harder. And then the calorie counts are kind of tricky. Like to eat enough chickpeas to get 100 grams of protein is really hard. To eat enough lentils or, you know, what have you, soy, you know, whatever, you know, and I'm not recommending it as well, but if you want to eat enough, I don't know, miso or tempeh or um, what's that stuff, tofu to get enough protein, it's doable, but then you you might be over your calories. So still a whole food plant-based diet would be the best, but adding fish to it, especially like fattier fish, like salmon, tuna, mackerel, sardines, not the ones dipped in oil, but like regular normal sardines. Fattier fish does seem to have a heavily protective effect, but not if it comes in a capsule. Like the fish oil itself, supplements, does not have a protective effect. And it's neutral to maybe even harmful in some scenarios, but it can help in other scenarios. So there's a lot of nuance. I don't know if I want to get into that. But generally, if you add fattier fish, the actual fish, it is protective. So we definitely recommend that. Um, and then if you want leaner cuts of meat, you know, other kinds, if you're not a big fish fan, there's always like turkey. There's always like turkey bacon. It's super lean. Chicken is really lean. Um, there are cuts of red meat that are lean, you know, like tenderloin generally doesn't have a lot of fat in it. And the most expensive is very tender, like filet, filet mignon and, and all the you know various tender cuts. Um, they're not that fatty. You could eat those. And that will give you, you know, but for me personally, like if I need enough protein, I usually just make whey protein shakes. It's super easy. A couple scoops of powder, shake it up in water, drink it, and you've covered your protein for the day as long as you eat another like piece of salmon or chicken breast later or or not even. You can just add more. Um, so that that's uh, gives you a little more flexibility. But it really just depends on what your food preferences are. Now, if you hate right. eating plants, then you're, you probably should pick something different. You know? Right. Totally. Okay, cool. So what I hear you saying is the overwhelming evidence is the closer to a plant-based diet that you can get, the better for long-term health benefits and long-term health outcomes. But the key here is for it to be sustainable. So instead of doing a fad diet of being on a plant-based diet for a month and then going back to you know, primarily unhealthy processed foods, lots of meat, then pick something that feels sustainable for your diet. So if you want to splurge and have a little steak here and there, that is great. Um, but keep it sustainable is most, most important message that I'm hearing from you. Is that correct? That is correct. Cool. That's awesome. That's so great. So the last thing I kind of wanted to touch on is a blood pressure and how does dietary cholesterol, how does that affect our blood pressure? I know you mentioned when you were talking about the diet and the cookbook that you have that it's either either you said low salt or no salt, um, low cho- cholesterol diet. Can you speak to blood pressure? That would be an interesting topic. Yeah. So blood pressure would be the second most you know, modifiable risk factor. So there's there what there's these things we call modifiable risk factors that you can modify, like lipids. There are some risk factors that you can't modify, like your age, your sex, your eye color, you know, whatever. Things like that you can't really change. They're your genetics. Um, but your lipids we can change. We can get you if you change your diet, it can get better. If you get on medications, it can get better. The other the next one would be like social determinants of health. Um that one is huge nowadays, you know, where you live, how much money you make, what school systems are available to you. Are there grocery stores available to you? Is food affordable to you? Um, do you live in a food desert or not? Social determinants of health are huge. You know, lack of education generally correlates highly with worse outcomes. Um, but then the next one would be hypertension. So there are ways to eat. Um, there's there's a thing called a DASH diet, D-A-S-H, dietary 
Um, it's very similar to a Mediterranean diet. It's just like super low um, oh, dietary salt. dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Okay, there you go. Dash. dash. It's called the Dash diet. Mm-hmm. Dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Um, I, I thought it was solve hypertension, but stop sounds way better. <laughs> but generally, it's basically a Mediterranean diet, sort of, but just almost little to no salt. We know based on data and research that the less salt you eat in your diet, the more pliable your arteries are going to be. And when they stiffen and they're not pliable, that's when you get uh, high blood pressure. Not to mention all the hormone, the hormonal triggering that salt in and of itself does. Um, salt also does increase inflammation. They have done studies where they've given people just salt and their inflammatory markers go up. So salt and saturated fat both increase inflammation. So we know if you keep those lower, um, that would help. So mainly it's going to be just reducing salt intake. That'll keep your, that that will do the single most thing uh, in terms of diet. In terms of other lifestyle things you can do, it's very similar to what we've been talking about. Cardio, weightlifting, exercise, those kind of things, they help your arteries become pliable too, and your blood pressure can get lower. Now, obviously, while you're actually exercising, your pressure is going to be higher, your inflammation is going to be higher. But at baseline, once you've recovered, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes later, your blood pressure will be lower, inflammatory markers go down, long term, it's better for you, your arteries are more pliable, they, they have better diastole or, you know, diastolic compliance, we call it. Um, that kind of stuff really, really helps. Um, so it's basically a Mediterranean diet, lower salt or almost no salt if you can, and more exercise. But it's like the same kind of stuff, more fruits, more vegetables, more fiber, right. Um, all the stuff we've been talking about. Really interesting. So you hear a lot of people, salt is a fascinating topic to me just because I, I've never been a sweets person. I've always been a salt person. And so if I lent towards any food addiction, it would definitely be the salt side of things. But as I've learned a little bit more about salt, and if you want to dive into the nuance a little bit more at all on salt, I'd be so interested because you hear controversial. Some people are like, you have to have salt, put a scoop. I've heard, put a scoop of Celtic salt in your water in the morning and stir it up and drink that to start your day. And I'm just, there's just so, I mean, with, with health stuff, there's always people on either side of the extremes, which is my heart behind this podcast is that there would be balance and it would be science fact. Right. And so, um, Salts, can you can you thrive on a no salt diet? I know Gerson therapy is a, a diet I've had friends do who have had cancer and different things, and that is a no salt diet, or they'll even supplement potassium into their diet. Um, can you can you speak a little bit more on salt? And then even you mentioned it, there's implications with hormones. I'm curious about that as well. Yeah, so so potassium is actually really helps lower your blood pressure. So and the, and the best way to get it is through fruit fruit, like kiwis, especially things like that have a lot of, I think kiwi has the most potassium per gram or whatever, uh, of all food substances. So potassium, absolutely fruits, citrusy ones, especially bananas a little, but not as much as citrusy stuff. Definitely lots of potassium that does lower your uh, blood pressure as well. The, the gimmicky stuff with the Celtic salt and the Himalayan salt and the pink salt and all that. Look, They've done studies and analysis on these things. They're 99.9999999999% sodium chloride, which is just regular salt. The problem is people hear that these salts are better for you, and they go only by Celtic salt or Himalayan salt or sea salt or kosher salt or whatever it might be. There's so many different ones. The problem is if there's no iodine in them, you could end up with like a giant goiter in your neck from your thyroid becoming overly enlarged, which can ultimately become life-threatening. So we definitely don't want that. So if you're not getting iodine somehow in your diet, uh, salt is a really easy way to do it, especially just regular old table salt. They're like, well, it's bleached and it's this, it has glass in it. Like people say the weirdest things. (laughs) There is no glass in salt, people. (laughs) That's just madness. Um, But yeah, like so you 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 get tons of salt anyway. So your body is very good at regulating electrolytes, whether it's potassium, calcium, salt, chloride, whatever. Um, almost any of those electrolytes, your body is fantastic at regulating. When you bite into an apple, there is salt in it. Um, there's potassium in it, there's sodium chloride in it, there's potassium chloride in it, even. There's, you know, almost anything you eat, even like a piece of meat or a piece of fish or you know, any fruit, vegetable, bean, legume. 
what have you, all has electrolytes in it, you know, huge amounts too. So you don't need to put salt in your water every morning so that you have enough salt that day. Uh, that's just nuts. I mean, it's fine if you like it. I mean, it's not, it, let's just put it, it's not harmful. Okay. okay. It's not going to cause harm, but it also has no benefit because the rest of the day, a lot of times if you get too much salt in your diet anyways, your body's just going to pee out more salt. It's tightly, tightly regulated. Same thing with calcium. Um, calcium is actually in your bloodstream incredibly uh, tightly regulated. If you, the upper limit of normal is 10.4, if you are at 10.5, you probably have cancer. Like that's how tightly regulated it is. If it's just 0.1 higher, there's something going on. There's a problem. So your body is very good at managing electrolytes. You do not need to help it. Um, just eat regular whole based foods, Mediterranean style diet, however, whatever diet you prefer. Even if you eat a pop tart, it has salt in it. So it does, it has potassium in it, it has like chloride, it has like magnesium, selenium, like all that stuff. You don't need to help your body out, um, by consuming, like going out of your way, let's say to consume more salt. You should actually go out of your way to consume less salt. Um, especially if you have a high blood pressure problem. That what would be is the, way more important. What is the recommendation for how much salt a healthy person should intake versus how much salt someone who might be dealing with high blood pressure should be intaking? So if you don't have high blood pressure, we generally tell people to eat like two to three grams a day at the most. Which, what does um, that look that like it, in a tablespoon? So I, or a teaspoon? So nine grams. So one tablespoon is about a gram. Okay. So it's not the salt shaker. People are like, well, I just sprinkle a little salt on my food with a salt shaker. That's not where you're getting the salt. The salt is in your food. That little sprinkle is nowhere near even half a point of whatever amount of salt. It's not very much. But one tablespoon is generally a gram, uh, which is a lot. Um, so it's hard to get that much. But generally, somebody with heart failure, you know, we tell them to keep their salt intake below 1.5 to 2 grams. Uh, depending on the person. Did you say so tablespoon, tell people, tablespoon or teaspoon? You know, that I, I thought it was tablespoon. We could easily check that. Yeah. You check that while okay, I I'll check that. Uh, say this. Um, but somebody with heart failure, usually want to under 1.5 to 2 grams of um, salt per day. A normal person between two and 3,000 milligrams or 2 to 3 grams a day um, is generally not a problem. Um, so it really just kind of depends on the person. An average person who doesn't have a blood pressure problem we don't really tell them anything. If they come to me and the, you know they're 20 years old, 30 years old, younger, and they're like, my pressure's starting to creep up, we do tell them, try to cut salt intake. Um, the problem is it's not that easy to track because you'd have to use like a food tracker all the time because it's not the salt that you're using in the salt shaker. Like it would be easy if it was a salt shaker and you sprinkle it and you see how far it went down, but it's not that. It's like the food that you're, tra you're eating. So like the deli meat that you have, that sliced turkey has salt in it. You have to go scan it and look at how much it is. Scan the apple or type in the apple, see how much it is. Like it's not that easy uh, to do. But if you tell people generally try to reduce salt intake, they kind of know what you mean. It's really the packaged foods more so like the microwavable dinners, you know, the microwave dinners Cans and the microwave of soup. lunches. Right. And beans even. Like if you buy a canned beans, that sticky, thick solution they're in is a lot of salt. So that's why we tell you to rinse your beans when you first buy them. Also, they don't give you as much gas. Mm -hmm. um, but if you take beans out of a can or anything that's canned or packaged or frozen or whatever, but beans for certain, just rinse them off, uh, you know, get, get all that yeah. stuff off of them because that's where all the salt is usually. Yeah, that's great. So a teaspoon of table salt is six grams, while a teaspoon of kosher salt is five grams. So, so that, that's way. So like two, so even less than that, you yeah. said teaspoon, right? Teaspoon. Wow. That's tiny. Yeah. That's a tiny amount of salt. So if you're saying you said three grams is. Yeah. Usually under three for most people. So that would be half of a teaspoon. Like half of those. Right. For a and healthy a, a individual. Person with heart failure, you want to be even lower than them. You want to be under yeah. one and a half or two. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's a low amount of salt. <laughs> whenever <laughs> whenever I started paying attention to how many grams of sugar, I think it's recommended less than 10 grams of sugar in a day. I un unless I mean you just can't eat any drink any packaged even 
kombucha or anything like that, all of those drinks have like 16 grams or more of sugar in them, which I think is so wild. I think a lot, I think there's a lot of people, not everyone, and this is a whole nother conversation. I think there are a lot of people who, if they knew what was the right thing to do for their body based on science backed research, that was pretty sussed out, which I think that is actually been determined that a lot of people would adhere to it, but there is so much noise and so much confusion out there in the medical community, let alone the internet um, and everything that is just, there's a lot of noise, information noise in this day and age. So it becomes hard, hard for people. Part of it is good because it's like the democratization of knowledge that anybody can go to YouTube and watch a lecture like that I gave at a medical conference or that you give to, you know, students or at a conference or whatever. I can go watch a business meeting and a business lecture, you know, so much of that is good. But if I'm not equipped with the background knowledge of what that business stuff is about, I don't really know how to apply it. Right. So I'm, I'm not a business person. If I go watch a meeting on, I don't know, how to improve production at your company. I mean, it's cool. It's fascinating, but I have no idea what to do with it because I don't know the background info. The problem with cholesterol and food and diet, do you know Alan Aragon at all? Mm-mm, I'm not familiar. So he wrote a book called Flexible Dieting. Okay. Um, he's 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 fantastic. You can follow him on all social medias. His name is The Alan Aragon. Um, you should probably interview him. He's really cool. But one of the things he mentioned in his in his book, Flexible Dieting, is that everyone thinks they're allowed to give diet advice because everyone eats, you know, everyone <laughs> eats food. So they think they're a food expert. Yeah. <laughs> so because every human being eats, they think that they are qualified to give food and diet and nutrition advice because they're experts. Um, same thing probably with cholesterol, I would say, maybe not as much as food, but like a lot of people think we all have cholesterol. I eat food, you know, food, cholesterol, whatever, nutrition, who are you to tell me what's good for you? Right. Like, you know, it's not that simple. Sure. We yeah. understand cholesterol and you could probably learn a little bit about it by Googling it and watching a few lectures, but it's not the same as having like an actual expert who has spent their entire life uh, studying the topic and knows it inside out, who hopefully can explain it to you in a way that it makes sense to you. Right. Totally. It's like if you need to fix your car, maybe you could Google some things. But when it gets to a certain point, you got to take it to somebody who knows what they're doing. (laughs) Before you break it. Yeah, before you break it. (laughs) Exactly. That's so great. Man, well, it's been so great having you on, Dr. Allo. Thank you so much. And for those who are listening, we're so glad that you were listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more healing stories and expert interviews, please be sure to subscribe to our channel. We're so glad to have you and hope to have you again, Dr. Allo. This has been an awesome conversation. If people are wanting to connect with you or find resources that you may have available, where would they go? So you could just go to, you just search for me on any platform, drallo.net, and there's always that link section at the top. If you go to drallo.net slash links, you can get like my cookbook, my weight loss book, a bunch of free guides, exercise guides, lipid guide. There's a free lipid guide, you know, like how to read your lipid panel, what to do with it, what it means. There's a five-step quick weight loss guide. A lot of that stuff is completely uh, free. But just go to drallo.net slash links and you can grab all that stuff. Message me, text me. I answer all my uh, messages uh, for now since I can. <laughs> As you notice, you know, you message me and we're doing this mm-hmm. interview. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks again. All right. Thanks for having me.